is things like brain machine interfaces, right? The idea of you being able to not just wear a suit, right? But maybe just sit down and connect parts of your brain, either non invasively or invasively, and be immersed in the virtual world. Welcome to the Alpha Podcast, made possible by West Coast Customs and Neverland Studios, hosted by me, Jussup. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody that what you're about to hear is not financial advice, nor do we endorse any of the guests or projects on the show. This is simply meant for educational purposes, and oftentimes I'm learning about these projects in real time as we're recording them. While this is brought to you by West Coast Customs and Neverland Studios, the opinions expressed are of my own or the guests, and not of the companies. So without further ado, let's tap into the episode. Welcome to another episode. We're here with Irvin. Uh, Irvin actually put the entire Solana Hacker House together here in Miami, right? Yeah, I did a lot of the logistics, uh, you know, alongside with uh, Jordan and Bartosz, Say, Chico, and Tristan. So it was very last minute, I think, uh, but we came all through, and the community's super excited about it, as you can see. Yeah. So, and we're we're live at the Hacker House. I've said that a few different times. It's been pretty cool. We've seen a bunch of people from the Solana ecosystem. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and, and what you're working on. Sure. So currently, uh, I am the co-founder of Open Dive Technologies, and we're sort of focused on immersive reality, tech, and gaming. So, and when you combine these two aspects together and introduce concepts of blockchain and crypto economics, then you have everything related to the metaverse. I guess a bit of a background. Uh, a lot of people say I'm a grandpa, a Bitcoin grandpa in a sense, <laughs> or a cryptocurrency grandpa. Someone just told me today that been up, like Omo's been in the space for 10 years. My friend and I, Ube, who we interviewed, we launched uh, the central bank. So a uh, pretty early push on uh, Bitcoin and finance and payment gateways. And then we exited in 2014. And from then on, actually, I've been focused on research. So that's my that's my thing. I like to kind of explore the tech. Not only be able to apply it, but how do we extend it uh, to real world use cases. So everything related to immersive reality, gaming, blockchain, and also going into the era of robotics. You know, we could talk about that if you want, but that's a bit of a background. So I guess you, have, um, you do some PhD research stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it's been put on hold uh, currently. Um, we, we launched Open Dive Technologies actually early this year. You know, and like the short story was that uh, my co-founder, Sean, and I, we were working on a lot of things related to gaming and robotics, actually. Uh, and so... Things like narrative generation models using AI, uh, being able to create environments using artificial intelligence. Uh, we actually built uh, something that people call the Ready Player One suit, which essentially is a haptic mechanical suit that you can wear and control virtual avatars. And then where the virtual avatar gets hit or striked, then you can relay the feedback to the user. And right. this could be extended to robotics. Yeah. And so I put that academic research a bit on hold. We're still doing research and now focusing on open dive and building open era and also our our products and working with you guys now. Can you tell me a little bit about open era? Or I guess the products, because you have uh, one of the coolest wallets that. Yeah. So I want to know a little bit about the wallet. Sure. I guess I get get a bit of context too, because uh, interestingly enough, I mean, so we we had a a mobile wallet on Solana like in August and it was an alpha. The the reason, you know, why we went from building Open Era, which is this, uh, an MMORPG, has played around mechanics and other things you know, that we kind of focus on, like off-game experiences. But what took us to, to build the water is because when we were building Open Era, we were designing a lot of you know, legendary weapons and a lot of these NFTs that were, were 3D models that were engaging, right? And so from a gaming perspective or user perspective, you know, gaming and NFTs from gaming should be fun. And so whenever we showcase people the work that we were doing on our laptops, you know, on Blender or other kind of like rendering engines, um, they're amazed, like seeing something animated, like a sword coming together and tearing apart, or a character or a legendary cape or something, right? When you see that in action, it's, it's amazing, right? Exciting. <laughs> so for a lot of people that we show them next to, next, next to us looking at our laptops, they were impressed and amazed that it was cool. But whenever we did the Zoom call, it's to kind of showcase this to people, and we're like, hey, look, this is on our Chrome extension wallet. It's an NFT, and I can send it to you. They're like, this looks pretty cool. Yeah. You know, like the reaction is different. Dumb down. It's a <laughs> yeah, 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 it's exactly. I mean, nonchalant. <laughs> and, and, you know, what kind of made us realize really was that um, it's, it's, it's not only just about how you create the content, right, or, or the media, like in NFTs. It's about how you consume it. And so we realized that, you know, in short, a lot of the current cryptocurrency wallets are boring. They're boring wallets, right, for NFTs. The same model, the same UX, UI is used across, as you can notice. Uh, and so we wanted to build uh, a cryptocurrency wallet that particularly focused on experiences for gaming and NFTs. 
And that's where, you know, Kiomi, the wallet comes in because essentially we want to allow people to kind of create these experiences for NFTs or create and collaborate with NFTs. Like if you look at our demos, we talk about being able to decorate your walls with NFTs, being able to put a frame around it, being able to combine uh, a music NFT alongside, you know, traditional visual uh, focused NFT and so on. So that's where it came about. It started with OpenEra, uh, and then we just realized that we needed a better way to kind of consume. If we're, if we're, if we're going to take kind of like gaming or Web 3.0 and gaming into the next level, we need to have a way to consume, you know, NFTs. Yeah, and um, there there is actually a demo on your Twitter, so people can go and look and and actually see what he's talking about. But it legitimately is an experience. A demo on there that I'm actually referring to is with the whale, where you drop it in. What is that? Um, Grand Central. Grand Central, yeah. yeah. So, like, it's an AR whale that comes out of the ground and it just like completely. It, there's sound. It's it is cool. It, it's a it's an experience for sure. And to be able, like, I know we have talked about that with uh, doing that with cars and and you know, it's cool that you can see the art, but can you have an experience with that vehicle, that NFT, that it's bringing it almost merging the worlds, right? Yeah, it's, it is really about the experiences, right? Um, and that's what's most memorable about it. You and I talked about, for example, what would it look like to do um, next generation drop, NFT drop for West Coast Customs. And if you look at the traditional model, the traditional model for NFT drops is you go to a website, you mint, you know, if you're in Ethereum, you wait a bit, <laughs> and then you ref refresh the page, and then the NFT shows up in your, in your wallet, right? Or the website, whatever it is. Next generation, or maybe the way that it should be, where it's more focused on the experience is that you pull out some kind of device, maybe it's your phone and you have our wallet inside and then maybe you mint the NFT, but you have your wallet open and perhaps, you know, a little giant gift box pops up in your living room, right? And you're waiting for it, maybe there's a timer, right? It's clicking, it's clicking, the timer hits, it unwraps, or maybe you <laughs> walk to it and you unwrap it. The box opens up. And it's an amazing, you know, West Coast custom vehicle. Yeah. Right. And then you take it down to the next level, the next level of experiences, you hear the engine roar. Right. right. And you can touch it perhaps and interact with it. Well, I think, yeah, once you get to that point too with haptic stuff, like, as like it becomes just as good as having it in real life. Right? <laughs> I think so. And we're going we're gonna to get to that point. I mean, yeah. so uh, science fiction has defined a lot of the research that has been done. People talk about augmented reality. People talk about cryptocurrencies, robotics, stuff people were talking about, you know, almost decades ago yeah, yeah. in science fiction books, right? And we're making it happen. What are some of the things that you've seen good and bad when we're talking about metaverse? Is like it's, it's really amazing that people, I guess, you know, because really big players and industry, Web 2.0 play, players have kind of opened up to this concept that we see more engagement and more adoption and acceptance of these concepts, right? And so currently, for example, one thing that you know, people don't think about that, you know, what will happen in the metaverse is things like brain machine interfaces, right? The idea of you being able to not just wear a suit, right? But maybe just sit down and connect parts of your brain, either non-invasively or invasively, and be immersed in the virtual world. Or perhaps controlling a physical avatar, a robot, yeah. right? So it hasn't gotten there. But for a starting point, people are understanding that, you know, perhaps this concept of being able to have augmented experiences or be able to be present virtually somewhere is now there. Right. Which, you know, if you honestly look at the research from decades ago, people were talking about it, people thought it was insane. I mean, I did, I, I published some papers and I went to some conference, like, like top tier conferences and I talked about cryptocurrency and metaverse stuff. People thought it was, it was insane. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and so that's a good part that we're seeing adoption kick in. Right. And also then, you know, because the metaverse now is connected to uh, the world of cryptocurrencies, you know, slash gaming and slash blockchain is that that's also been pushed towards adoption. One of the things that I'm not a fan of is that, you know, we've seen the bastardization of the concept of the metaverse. Uh, and I think that happens for almost every, every single emerging technology or emerging uh, product within technology. Because right? currently everything is a metaverse. <laughs> yeah. You launch uh, a point click a uh, game and has a, a token, it's a metaverse. You know, there's some games that are like exact cl clones of other, other kinds of like games out there uh, and they're not adding any additional value or utility to the, the actual uh, gameplay or loop and, and they're a metaverse and they call themselves a metaverse, quote unquote. And that's a good and bad thing because now like it essentially is going to become a type of social consensus on what the metaverse is. But I think, you know, that's, that's good and bad uh, because, you know, a lot of people have worked on this stuff 
early on. Like if you look at research in 1970s, 1980s, and so on, 1960s, people were talking about virtual reality and being immersed in it. So the concept of, for example, um, being able to have interoperability between real worlds has always been there. Yeah. It's been, it's been the concept, right? Discussions over inclusivity. So can you navigate or traverse these virtual worlds without being, you know, gated? It's been there. Those questions have been there. And, right. and so if we as folks who are in the Web 3.0 don't take a stance to kind of develop the concept of the metaverse, or we think the metaverse in parallel to our actual core values of Web 3.0, if we don't stand for this, then we're going to see, you know, traditional Web 2.0 industry kind of take over and define what it should be. And I think that's already starting to happen. Uh, I've been in a lot of different kind of discussions and <laughs> Twitter spaces where, you know, folks who haven't really been in the space for quite a while, folks who might, might have not looked into engineering are proposing ideas of what they think the metaverse should be. Uh, one, one example was uh, someone was discussing that, oh, interoperability between gaming, it, that, can, that can happen. Like, how is that going to happen? You know, because there's a lot of constraints with the game engine and being able to render, you know, objects in, in, in real time. And I'm just there, I, like, I was there and they brought me in. I'm like, you know, like, my co-founder and I have actually worked on game engines. And this is quite feasible. It's just the fact that, you know, current traditional game engines don't allow for that because nobody ever accounted for that, right? Because essentially, interoperability between games currently happens at the business level. That's what, I, yeah. Right? It, it almost comes down to financial right like mm -hmm. call of duty now take the skins from fortnite call of duty doesn't make any money if they buy skins over there and want to go take it into their game so i, I it almost becomes a business agreement that you're going to have to have in order for it to to, to do that because it almost always it comes down be. to monday it could be so, so, but that you know that's the, that's the narrative that people propose and that's the narrative this this, this uh, gentleman was was discussing you know that yeah essentially if you are a big gaming company. Yeah. Are you going to allow someone to walk out of your economy with their assets? He didn't mention the economy, right? right? Because essentially, once you give the user the freedom to leave this world with what they should own, then what happens to your economy, your right. world? And then essentially, we might end up with similar scenarios as what happened with Uniswap and SushiSwap. Maybe a vampire attacks where <laughs> certain like virtual worlds, you know, like get drained out and <laughs> get put into a different game. But my personal stance, and I believe that the stance from Web 3.0 folks, should be that that's, that's not our problem. Our problem should be to build great, amazing experiences for our users, right? Right, And that's what should be our focus. You know, just because your enterprise or your corporate you know, virtual experience or metaverse business is going gonna, is gonna to lose users because perhaps you're not attending to your users or building experiences, that is your problem. Yeah. But we as Web 3.0 people have to build for our users, right? Not for the corporations. People are afraid to hire good employees because they're and train them to be good in the fear of leaving. And I, my stance is always like, as a leader, it's your job to provide enough value that they want to stick around. And that could, I almost feel like, translate to to what you're talking about too, is if you're building for the users, it's your job to build something that is going to keep people there because <laughs> you are responsible for, for providing value to the users. They're not going to leave if you're continuously providing value. <laughs> yeah, so this actually is this quite interesting. There's a parallel to this, you know, a while back, you know, like in traditional Web 2.0, it, it's always been within the work environment. It's about you making friends with your coworkers, right? All right. Whereas with Web 3.0, you have the opportunity to make your friends your coworkers, right? Get them engaged, involved in your vision, your products, which is very different, right? But when we're tackling this, you you essentially have to bring them on board, right? You have to sell them the vision and work together. It's very different from corporate. This episode is brought to you by Neverland. And no, we're not talking about the California ranch. You're probably wondering, aren't you a founder? Yes, I am, and I'm not here to bullshit you. Along with my two cousins, Mark and Kurt, our partners, Rob and Evan, and the world-famous West Coast Customs, yes, the guys behind Fit My Ride, we're building a car customization, collecting, and racing game on the blockchain called Empire App. Empire App will sit in the Neverland world, along with the Meta Whips and the Meta Racer minigame, the Crypto Dad Dadlands mower racing game, and the ever-expanding metaverse that's going to continue to grow. You can find out more by visiting www.neverland.io. That's www.nvrland.io. Let's get back into the episode. I think it's uh, you, you grow faster when you can work together that way. I think stronger. 
I yeah. think we've seen that a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of relationships that were made. For example, if you look back on, on Bitcoin talk, like early days, relationships will only have to be built physically. They could be virtually, right? It could be solely based on respect or contributions to the product, right? I think that's within tech side. Like, you look at someone like, wow, did they actually just build this on their own, right? And there's so much respect to their discussions and thinking as well. So it's both, you know, physically and also virtually it could happen. Well, and we're seeing that, I mean, even with these NFT communities, like they're, yeah. pe people are coming together. Like <clears throat> the fact that people unionized with the uh, trash pandas and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> gamed the fair launch, like. <laughs> <laughs> Did Jordan talk about that? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but it's just crazy that like people are building connections even, even and I guess that's also like how DAOs are being formed is people working remotely. <laughs> I think we're also seeing that a lot. I'm very curious on how much COVID and lockdowns has played in the acceleration to all of this. And, you know, are people going to be searching for those external experiences from home still? Yeah. Um, you know, or there's, there's talks of lockdowns and again, again yeah. So uh, I'm, curious on how things will accelerate from that you know i, I would say probably the the, the one <laughs> industry research field is super excited about this is human computer interaction yeah because you know the, the biggest problem to having these immersive experiences or being in virtual reality or gaming and stuff like that is the ux and this relates to human computer interaction right like fatigue like virtual reality fatigue uh, and this association, you know, between the vision, auditory, senses is a real thing, right? right? Uh, and so it definitely has played a key role. And you could see that, look, so there's like, so we do like at Open Dive, we do a lot of like data, data-driven analysis and thesis. Um, everyone, I think most of the part, everyone knows that if you go on Google right now and you look at Google Trends probably since uh, January of this year, you put NFTs, <laughs> you see the trend, right? Yeah. You see the spike, you do the comparison now on Naver, which is, you know, the search engine, biggest search engine in, in Seoul, Korea. It's like a month or two after, right? <laughs> you do metaverse stuff. The same thing happens. Really? Yeah. So that's, that's uh, data-driven stuff, and, you know? And so it definitely played a key role. And also, if you look at also, like, the metrics for Clubhouse, there's, like, some sites for the metrics on Clubhouse. I, I would personally say that Clubhouse had a key role in onboarding a lot of people into cryptocurrency. I think there's no denying this at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> so everyone spent... I, I actually met a lot of friends from, uh, from Clubhouse uh, here and when we went to Lisbon and so on. People were there for, like, 10, 20 hours within these rooms, I and, I, and I was there, and... And people found that NFTs. I remember doing like people's first minting or installation just virtually and remotely. And it was just insane. <laughs> and some of these people went off to build their own NFT projects too, like yeah. in a short, short span. So it did play a role. Yeah. I've been asking everybody what uh, was the last NFT they purchased. Do you have the last NFT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last NFTs, we purchased a ton of Little Rocks NFTs. Yeah. It's a really cute NFTs, I think. They, <laughs> the team put a lot of work on like the design stuff because we, we discussed early on iterations on how to do them. And so those are those are pretty cute. And then we're also looking at some upcoming ones too. Um, you know, the, the one that I'm excited, of course, is, you know, like I would say there's a few that I'm quite excited. You know, the one for, for West Coast Customs, <laughs> uh, also for, for Quicks, uh, which is one of our partners as well. We're excited for that one because it's also Quicks. gaming related. You mentioned the, the, the rocks are cute. And it's funny because a theme that actually a few people have said is like, for some reason, uh, having a good PFP, <laughs> adorability has to be built into. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. No, actually, so that is true. But it's also another thesis that, you know, the the crappiest, or I guess there's, I think, a, a barrier, kind of like level of aesthetics, I think. Yeah. There's some, some NFTs that you could tell these are like, they look kind of awkward or strange if you buy them. You yeah. Know, just like <laughs> strange stuff. Jordan and I were talking about when uh, I showed him the, the West Coast Customs PFP, the Metal Whips, and it, we were talking about how like, it find, we, we were having to find the balance between like, if it was a photorealistic car, like yeah. nobody, people put it in their collection, more than likely nobody's putting that as their PFP, right? Because there's not a human connection. You don't feel like that represents you. It's your car. So that was what we were trying to find the balance of what for with these meta whip PFPs was like, how do we make them a cool car, but have personality and also not go the other way where it's too cheesy. And it's like, 
from Disney cars, you know, <laughs> it, it was a balance of having to find that. And, um, I think they turned out cool. So I think so too. I, I think, I think they're, they're, they're pretty interesting. They do have character. <laughs> that, that is the thing. You like, when you look at all the big ones, it's like you, you create a connection. This is based on research you always do, right? Yeah. That's why like dogs, you know, like <laughs> resemble their owners and back and forth yeah, totally. and so on. And also I guess your car at a certain stage of your life, there is that aspect that people have to look into. And some, some NFT projects don't consider that, you know? Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming on, man. I yeah. appreciate, appreciate your time. And, uh, any, can you name some handles that people can follow you on? Uh, Yep. Yep. So, uh, you can follow us at uh, Open Dive HQ, and then you know Open Era. Our MMORPG is at Open Era HQ, and then if you want, you know, just give me a shout out at or shoot me a DM over at um, at Irvin X Y Z on Twitter, and of course, keep an eye for what West Coast Customs is doing with Open Dive as well. Yeah, we got some cool cool stuff. So yeah. thanks for your time, man. Thank you guys for watching and listening wherever. So appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks.